Welcome to Nurture Small Business, creating a thriving space with your host, Denise Kagan. Denise is the president of DCA Virtual Business Support and has been a business owner for almost 20 years. DCA Virtual Business Support provides small businesses with an expert pairing of virtual administrative and marketing assistance to match your needs. Learn more at dcavirtual.com. Chris Danny is a researcher, trainer, author, consultant, and business owner. When he's not running a business or spending time with his family, mostly hiking or snowboarding, he's researching attention to detail or helping organizations develop attention to detail and accuracy. Chris delivers training workshops and seminars for private companies and government organizations and even provides one-on-one coaching for high-value employees. Welcome to the show today, Chris. Thanks so much. It's really nice to be here. So uh, when I spoke to you earlier, I understand you are a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, even if kind of by accident, but, but yeah, I, I am. <laughs> so you, you own three businesses. Can you just give us a quick overview of the, because I found it fascinating, they aren't really related. Yeah, and that's uh, somewhat by accident and, and somewhat by design. So uh, in about 2008, I started a, a marketing agency, and we're an outsourced marketing department. Uh, for, our, for our main clients, we handle everything they do. And of course, we have clients who we you know, made their website and that sort of thing. We just do some online stuff. Um, while operating that company, <clears throat> excuse me, I had an employee whose technical ability was fantastic, but he lacked the what I was labeling attention to detail to produce client-ready work. And we just couldn't have that. And so I, but I did want to keep him. So I looked for training or something to, to help him improve. And I couldn't find anything. I mean, I would anything, workshop, book, something. And so being an entrepreneur, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll make a worksheet or something. I'm creative. And, but I thought it would take like an evening. And so six years later, I kind of emerged with this system. And no, I didn't get to keep the employee. Everyone, I always ask that. Um, <laughs> You know, I'd, I'd let him go after a couple of months, but I did find this passion for this, this reducing errors and improving accuracy and improving attention to detail overall and really went down the rabbit hole. And then, I mean, that six years was just hobby, basically. And, and I did a lot of it. I mean, my wife would even ask me what, what's up with this thing. And um, I got a call, I would post stuff and I, I really didn't mean to do it as a business, but someone asked me to come to a workshop and I had just kind of finished the system and I was just kind of looking at it on the whiteboard. And so I told them, you know, Hey, give me some time. I'll, I'll, I'll tidy it up and I'll come do it. And they liked it. And from then on or people requested it and now there are online courses and coaching and all that. So that's. So it sounds like you fell in face first to this. I mean, you had totally. your Guinea pig lined up without trying uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, all this research and a, a natural situation just led you there. That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of fun, a really nice organic sort of entrepreneur story. You know, it, it, I've always enjoyed that part of it that I did just fall into it. So, um, the third company is actually a chemical company. And that was an old friend of mine actually called me about doing marketing. And the more they talked about the business and they were just putting it together and looking for partners. And so I, I became a partner in the company. Um, that company is called DRP Chemicals, and we specialize in waste treatment uh, products. So organic waste treatment products for everything from, you know, residential and commercial septic systems to municipal wastewater treatment. And that one is growing quickly, and it's a it's a lot of fun, and I love working with the partners. Well, the first two are a little more closely related, but this last one completely unrelated. I think, yeah. I think that's really cool. <laughs> it yeah. shows how diverse you are and what a wide <laughs> set of skills you have. Yeah. So, so this passion <clears throat> for attention to detail, when you were doing the research, tell me about some of the things that you uncovered. Oh my gosh, how many things? So, so just a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think part of the, part of what I love so much about it is that I was diving into all the things that I had done in my education and um, and just all the stuff I kind of enjoy. So you get into cognitive psychology and you get into HR issues and you, you get into systems analysis and systems thinking and operational. And I really enjoyed it. And so, um, oh my gosh, I mean, you know, to, to pick a few things that, that, I, that I learned along the way, um, it really came about, uh, or I guess the big thing that, that I discovered was that 
part of the struggle around this issue of attention to detail, because it's a, it's a word we use every day. I mean, if you. Yeah, the phrase is very commonplace. Yes. Or detail oriented, you know, do it, do it. Look up resumes, you know, must be detail oriented is in so many res- resumes. And um, but I found that one of the main reasons people are so frustrated about it is because it's more complicated than than we generally give it credit for. And so that's where I came out with this this separation of three types of attention to detail. And that that's the big thing. So I find that once people sort of wrap their heads around that, it helps build that foundation. And then we talk about the five fundamental elements and all of that, but, but the three types are contrastive, additive, and analytical. And by just labeling that, it's like so many other things, it, it's, it seems so intuitive, but by just labeling that saying, okay, what are we dealing with here? Then, we can really help the individual who's kind of struggling a lot of times, um, or, and that might be ourselves, right? So, (laughs) yeah. And so by doing that, uh, we can help break it down. And if I'm, if it's okay, I can please give me, yes, please give me a little bit. Cause I was going to ask you, I, I contrastive and what were the other two additive and analytical. Okay. So the difference is, is pretty simple. Of course, there's some overlap, but the big deal with contrastive is that there's one solution. So it's, it's completely objective. It's, you know, two plus two is always four. The light is flashing where it's not the, you know, the, the two columns match or they don't. It, there's one solution completely. It's either right or it's wrong. Analytical moves into being more solution oriented. So you have subjectivity there. Now, what you always want to do is break things down into their contrastive elements, because by doing so, you can you can remove some of the need for, for knowledge, so helping to reduce human error. Along with that, you can systematize. So now we can break things down into, let's say, a checklist or some kind of process where we can take out some of that requirement for the knowledge component. We don't have to have a PhD in the room anymore. We can break it down, and at least other people can contribute, if not take care of things altogether. And then you have uh, additive. And additive is really about improvement, it's about innovation. And so it's, it's much more complex. The big deal there is that it's typically almost entirely subjective and there could be numerous solutions. So, you know, again, on, on the contrastive end, you have one possible solution. On the additive end, you could be changing the world. So um, most of us operate in the analytical arena in that area. You know, it's what's the best strategy to improve sales next quarter? It's, it's that sort of thing. And so you, you break it down into its contrastive elements by looking for all of the elements at hand. So what technology do we have? What technology exists? What are, what are competitors doing? What are, you know, what do we have? What, what, what's our, what are our human resources? Uh, how much money do we have? You know, can we do this? Does this make sense for what we do? Uh, everything, right? And by doing that, then you can really get a full picture and create at least a couple of solutions. You know, it's hard to pick the best one, but uh, you can you can come much closer to a good solution. Well, it sounds like to me the three different styles. Um, your additive one sounds a lot like your visionaries. You know, the people that are right. high level thinkers, innovators, creating inventors, creating systems, and that sort of thing. Right. Which sounds like you got a little bit of that in you. Um, <laughs> and then the analytical sounds like more what a CEO would need to run a company. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good breakdown. I mean, again, most of us operate in that analytical sort of arena. Um, I mean, everyone from someone in the chemistry lab to the CEO. Um, the The big thing with additive is that a lot of people say, well, it's, you know, it's new, you can't, you can't systematize new. <clears throat> and that's true, but you can systematize the process by uh, that, that you use to find what to innovate, what to improve. So, you know, if you're just trying to improve a product, you can break everything down into its contrastive features. What does the market want? What is it, you know, what does it do now? What technology do we have? What, techn- what technology is coming up? And just really break it down and see what the opportunities are and find that opportunity for what to innovate around. That so, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you shared a technique with me um, because... Apparently, you apply this to processes in which people hire positions, yeah. and so you shared a technique 
with me. You want to share that with us? Yeah, yeah. That So, of course, doing this, I get asked a lot about, you know, how do I hire people that have strong attention to detail? And to really answer that, you have to break down, well, you're contrastive or, you know, analytical or additive. But there's one thing that you can do with resumes, and I call it the, the bird dog technique. And I don't remember where I learned this, but um, I learned it from a from a an engineer is is uh, what they did and called the bird dog technique. When you are looking for someone who has strong attention to detail, you can put in the resume a, a line. Don't try to hide it. Just put it in the center of the resume or, or the job description. I mean, somewhere that says attention to detail is exceptionally important for this role. If you would like to be considered, please include the word bird dog in your in your you know, email heading or subject line or in your resume or whatever. It does a few things and you don't have to use bird dog, by the way, you could use a job code, you could use whatever words relevant to you, but it should be yeah, something that normally wouldn't be in resumes, right? Right. It needs to be searchable. So what this does is that it actually, it actually serves two purposes. It knocks out what I call resume slingers, people who are just not even reading. They see a job title and they just, they just sling their resume at it. So it knocks them out. But then the people who do read it, they have to actually read all the way through. So, and you can do various versions of hiding and that sort of thing. And frankly, I've tested it over the years. If you hide it too much, you'll get a little bit of negative feedback from people uh, kind of saying like, hey, that's yeah, a bit much. That's but... kind of sneaky, right? <laughs> right. right? Right, right, right. And that's but, yeah, not really it, the relationship. It will save you a ton of time and, and help improve the people you're interviewing. Yeah. And that's not really the relationship you want to start off with working with somebody where they think you're kind right. of sneaky. Right. So no, I Absolutely. get that. You know, um, so what other so so what other areas do you apply this? Is it strictly to hiring or is it through other areas? No, in fact, it's barely to hiring. That's typically just a question I get when I'm in a workshop or you know, I get pulled aside by somebody. Okay. Typically, um, it's about error reduction. So it's about improving accuracy and reducing errors. And it people come to me. I would say 90% of the time for one or two reasons. One is there have been a series of little mistakes and they want to sort of make a cultural adjustment or there was one really big, massive, expensive mistake. Um, you, could, you could also say it's 50-50 that maybe they almost had one big, massive, expensive mistake. Like they lost their, almost lost their giant client because somebody goofed um, or they sent $3 million of the wrong product out the door. So they call me in for that and we do workshops, we do training, we'll do some one-on-one -on -one coaching with various people who, you know, at whatever level of involvement. And it's about helping people. I mentioned the five fundamental elements. That's the process we work through to help people understand, um, first of all, an appreciation for the importance and value of attention to detail in an organization, just how it affects themselves, how it affects others in the organization. Mm -hmm. And then we work through at the individual level even, uh, how they can, well, make fewer mistakes and, and generally be more accurate and thorough in the work they do. So when you apply it to an individual, it's really successful. That's what the coaching is all about. And then with the workshops and, and consulting, that's the implementation component. And you can, I don't like to say we're changing cultures. We're just making a little bit of a cultural adjustment because most companies that come to us actually are, are really solid, strong companies that really care about quality they just want a little more level it's the next it's the next level of thoroughness that we're that we're going for and so do you get pushback from the employees when you start talking to them about attention to detail uh no because it's something that everyone experiences so that's something i always like to go through with people is uh, you, you basically have sort of a detail orientation spectrum, and I, I always, I'm always completely open. This isn't scientific. This is just something that I like to start with to get people thinking kind of introspectively. At one end, you have what I call work or task detail oriented people, and these are these are it's kind of all of us. It, it's most of us, right? It's it's people who may not exhibit strong attention to detail in everything they do, or in even most things they do but they tend to be quite detail oriented in a hobby or in their job or in how they care for their kids or something like that. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are what I call naturally detail oriented. We all know somebody like this and their closets are perfectly orderly and their desk is neat and tidy and their you know, car is perfectly clean and all of those things, right? And so I just like to say, okay, kind of where are you 
on that spectrum. And most people fall sort of in the middle. And, you know, um, there's always in a workshop, there's, there's, there's always one person on, on each end of the spectrum. But for that reason, I don't really get pushback. Um, everyone's, everyone's open to it. Everyone realizes that they're not perfect. And, you know, there's, there's never anything about placing blame. It's just about helping you do what you do with a bit more excellence. Just do a little bit better every day and, and make fewer mistakes and be more accurate. So are you able to give our listeners just one tip on what they could do right now to improve their attention to detail and accuracy? Yeah. Um, so let's see here. <clears throat> Let me first say the five fundamental elements. Okay. Sure. So we've got focus and each of these, they, the words are so simple, but each of these has a lot of elements under them, but focus, interest, knowledge. So training and that sort of thing, systems. And then there's an attitude component. Um, typically without doing a bunch of research, without doing practice and that sort of stuff, you know, the biggest ways you can, you can make an improvement to your attention to detail is, uh, first, make sure you understand the value of your role and your task. A lot of times we overlook that mm -hmm. and we don't realize that the task we're doing at the moment might affect other people. And if we leave something undone, if we leave some mistakes in it, it means someone else, and they don't always bring the work back to us. Someone else is correcting something. It's affecting their day. It might frustrate a client, you know, hopefully not. But uh, so that's a big one. There are physical components, of course. I mean, just your basic, you know, get a little more sleep. It sounds so silly, but I, I mean, I almost hate saying it sometimes, but it's just true. Get a little more sleep, drink plenty of water, eat, eat properly, get a little bit of light exercise. Sometimes take a break every now and then. Take a five minute break, just get up. We preach that to our employees. It's like, if you're getting brain so fog, get up, shut off the computer, go walk around, go play with the kids, Absolutely, you know, cause all my team is remote. So playing with the kids is, is possible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, we always tell them, you know, if you're getting in a brain fog, you're getting stuck on something, take a break from it because right. you're just going to keep beating your head against the wall. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many different little things, but when someone asks me that question, I always try to give the ones that you don't have to do any, you know, exercise for. I mean, Okay, Rubik's cube. You know that's one. If you if you want to work on you know focus your ability. Did you actually solve that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I love it. <laughs> can I can I nerd out for just a second? Of so, course, yes, go for so it. So I didn't know how to solve a Rubik's cube probably three months ago, and um, now I love it, and I'm working on a four by four now, which is a totally different animal. But Ooh. here's the thing: I used to think you got to be really smart, you got to be a genius or whatever to do a Rubik's cube. It's a system. And so remember, I mentioned one of the five fundamental ele elements is a system. So my nine-year-old and I decided one evening, hey, we're going to do a Rubik's Cube. And so we looked it up. And yes, it took watching an 18-minute video about how to solve it. Uh, we must have watched it 20 times. And we wrote down all the steps. And then we worked on memorizing the steps and practicing. But after three weeks, I didn't need the instructions anymore. And after, say, five weeks, he didn't need the instructions. And now my nine-year-old solves it faster than me. So I just, I just love these things as an example of how you can apply a system. You don't have to figure out everything yourself. You can find the system, apply it, and actually create the solution. So, That's I, and I have one around all the time. They, for me, this is, you know, we mentioned breaks. So sometimes uh -huh. that's my five-minute break. I'll just, I'll mix it, it up and then just sit there and, and do it a couple of times. Absolutely. So. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> well, what one thing would you like to leave with our listeners uh, before we, we close out here? Um, attention to detail and improving attention to detail is not about perfection. So drop the word perfectionist, drop that. Uh, it, it actually, if anything, it impedes creativity. It impedes productivity mm -hmm. because there's no such thing as perfection. So Think about it in terms of excellence, because excellence is all about making constant improvements and doing things as well as you can. So I always like to make sure people understand that this is not about perfection. It's that's not a thing. That's not something that I, I allow in my workshops. I like that. I very much like that. So, Chris, how can people find you after um, our podcast? Uh, attention to detail.com, all spelled out. Attention to detail.com is the is the top way. So that's that's really the best way. And of course, I'm in LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect. Thank you for joining us for today's Nurture Small Business, creating a thriving space podcast. Learn more about your host at dcavirtual.com or by emailing her directly at denise at dcavirtual.com.